Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to the next lecture on Loop Back and Anger by John R. Stone. So we're continuing with the text. So we already have two lectures, I believe, on this particular drama. So this will be the penultimate lecture. So we have one more lecture after this and then we'll finish off with this particular text. So uh, we're looking at Loop Back and Anger obviously from the perspective of gender studies. Uh, so how is it related to gender? Uh, so in what sense is it a very important drama, a piece of theater, uh, on the different complexities of gender and gender performances? Uh, in a very political situation. So as I just mentioned, I've given you a backdrop of the play, uh, the cultural context which produced this play, essentially, uh, which is, you know, the post-Second World War, post-Imperial England, which is no longer a superpower. It's on its way uh, out of the world politics in terms of the global uh, clout that it used to enjoy. So this is an England which is essentially uh, emasculated uh, in, in, a, in a gendered sense. So it's not longer uh, a masculine, manly England uh, in world politics. So it is sort of essentially finding itself to be hysteric, uh, to be emasculated, to be neurotic, uh, and very, very anxious uh, in terms of its location in the current climate. Uh, and all it can do is look back either in anger or in nostalgia. So it has a past to look back to. Uh, the part of the people in England, uh, a certain section of people, which includes the protagonist, Jimmy Porter, they're looking back, they would look back uh, to the past and be angry about it because they look at the past as something which has cheated them of purpose. They would hold the past responsible uh, for the failure of the present. Now, there are certain other people like Colonel Redfern, uh, about whom uh, I sort of mentioned a little bit in my previous lecture. They would look back uh, to an imperial England with fondness, with a very fond nostalgia. So, in this particular lecture, what I'll do is I'll, I'll look at these two. Uh, types of gaze in look back in anger, the two kinds of looking in look back in anger, and a very complex gender politics which uh, uh, sort of categorizes this kind of looking back. So in one sense I'm saying, you know, you know looking back uh, to a past is also a sort of nostalgic, it gives you a fond nostalgia, uh, a glorified uh, memory of what England used to be as an imperial power. And in another sense, looking back also generates envy and, and bitterness and cynicism in you because you know you, you hold the past accountable for the failure of the present. Now we, we talked about the principal characters of Look Back in Anger. We also talked about some of the characters uh, who don't quite appear on the stage but they're mentioned and they're very important characters. They're very important third person presences in Look Back in Anger. Uh, you know these characters include uh, Hugh Tanner, uh, Jimmy's uh, former friend uh, about whom we'll speak in a, in a, in a minute. He's a very important character, Hugh Tanner. He doesn't appear in the play, but he's mentioned quite extensively, and he, he plays a very important symbolic function uh, in the play, especially in the map of masculinity that we see in Ludberg and Anger. Uh, the other characters who don't appear in the play, but are spoken of extensively and mentioned extensively, include uh, Hugh Tanner's mother, uh, Ma Tanner, who represents uh, the very complex combination of class and gender for Jimmy. So she's a working class innocent woman. So she's this very passive, naive, gullible, innocent woman who happens to be a purely working class person. So again, as I mentioned, uh, Look Back in Anger is a very important play in terms of gender studies, but also we need to mention, we need to remember that this is a play which keeps mixing up the gender and, and, and the class question. So we can't possibly do a, a gender studies reading of Look Back in Anger without taking into consideration the class question. So Ma Tanner, Hugh Tanner's mother, uh, is a very interesting combination of class and gender. So she's this very working class woman uh, who Jimmy loves. Now, we mentioned, I think we, we, I believe we stopped at the point in the last lecture, we talked about Jimmy's misogyny. So to what extent is this misogyny informed by his childhood trauma of seeing his father die? Uh, we, we, we've talked about that in some details in the previous lecture. Uh, to what extent is this misogyny informed by his absent mother, uh, the, the mother who was never there? Uh, and you know, he listened to a dying father uh, talking to him, and that sort of informed a bit of a childhood trauma for him, which 
uh, subsequently informed or generated this misogyny in Jimmy Porter. Now, the only mother figure, the only mother person in Lubak Nanga whom Jimmy uh, sort of looks up to very fondly and very affectionately and asexually uh, is Hugh Tanner's mother, Ma Tanner, uh, who represents for Jimmy the pure working class woman. So she is a woman uh, who doesn't threaten him. She is a woman uh, who doesn't have this you know, intimidating aura, uh, the erotic aura, uh, or the intimidating aura, and he doesn't feel uh, anxious or castrated or intimidated or eroticized in the presence of Ma Tanner. So Ma Tanner in Lubak in Anger represents this pure working class woman. So obviously this is a very conceptual category we're talking about. There's no such thing as a pure working class woman or a pure woman or a pure working class or anything along those lines. But this is a kind of purity which we're talking about in Jimmy Porter's imagination. So in his phenomenological imagination, he conceives of Ma Tanner as this pure working class woman who doesn't threaten him, who doesn't intimidate him, who doesn't eroticize him. Uh, so she is this perfect working class woman to Jimmy. Now she's another important character who doesn't appear uh, in the main play, but is spoken of, is talked about extensively in the course of the play. The other characters uh, who don't appear in the play, but are talked about quite extensively, include uh, Alison's brother, Nigel Redfern. We talked about him a little bit in the previous lecture. So Nigel represents this classic case of um, entitlement and nepotism. So he is just born into a very wealthy family. So he comes from a family with a background of imperialism. So, you know, their father, uh, Nigel St. Allison's father, Colonel Redfern, if you remember, uh, was a, a, a soldier in the Imperial Army. So he, he used to be stationed in India for the good part of his youth. And Nigel and, and Allison grew up in India entirely. So they used a very different kind of Englishness, uh, the very imperial Englishness, which you don't find after they've come back to England, uh, a post imperial England. Now, Nigel Redfern uh, represents, again, the sense of perverse entitlement and nepotism in British politics post Second World War. Uh, so, you know, he doesn't really have the qualification, doesn't really have any credentials uh, to be an important member of parliament, but just because he's born into a family, he's born into wealth, and he's been to Sandhurst, which is a military school, uh, you know, in England, a very posh, upper class uh, military school. So he gets an automatic ticket to parliament uh, in that sense, which is very unfortunate because we have, on the other hand, someone like Jimmy Porter, as we, we've seen, you know, he's someone uh, who has a university degree, he obviously is intelligent, he uh, obviously has a lot of um, intuitive understanding of the world around him, and he's, he's, he's wonderfully educated as well in terms of his language and his expression and his understanding of the world. But despite all this, and despite a degree from a university, he finds himself running a street stall in an open air market. Now, this, of course, tells you something about the economic condition of England at that point in time, but also, and equally, it also tells you something about the, the culture of nepotism, the culture of entitlement that England was suffering from uh, after the Second World War, after imperialism. So Nigel Redfern, another character who doesn't appear uh, in the main play, but is talked about extensively, uh, he represents a certain kind of cultural condition in England at that point in time. Now, among the other characters who don't appear in the play, but are talked about, is, Ni is Alison's mother, Alison and Nigel's mother, uh, Mrs. Redfern. Now, we talked about uh, in the previous lecture how the anger in Look Back in Anger is very, very gendered. So it's a very manly kind of an anger which is directed against the female. But there is almost a sense of violence, a degree of violence done to the female in Look Back in Anger. So Alison, you know, he's, she's obviously the recipient of Jimmy's violence. Now the violence is you know, on, one's, one's on le one level is rhetorical. So on a surface level it's rhetorical. So we can say that you know, Jimmy is angry and he's sort of blurting out or vomiting out this anger uh, through words. But after a certain point of time, you get a sense of a visceral anger, a visceral violence. So, you know, the violence which is directed at Alison through words become visceral after a certain point of time. And this transition from verbal violence to visceral violence happens in Act One, the very opening scene in the back in anger, where we have Jimmy in a mad tirade against Alison, and then Cliff gets up and the two of them have a mock wrestling fight. Uh, and then at some point in the fight, the top lower. Uh, and you know the crash against Jimmy crashes against Alison's ironing board, and the the, the very hot uh, iron uh, you know burns the hand, etc. So you know that that's the entire scene there is a very good example of the transition from verbal violence to visceral violence. And obviously, the object of the violence is a woman, uh, unsurprisingly. So it's a very male kind of violence, and we find that you know behind its violence, behind its rage of Jimmy Porter, behind its anger at Jimmy Porter is a very hysterical, important, ineffectual man. So the, 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 the hysteria of Jimmy uh, 
the ineffectuality of Jimmy, the importance of Jimmy uh, as a person uh, is symptomatic or is reflective uh, in some sense of the hysteria of England, post-imperial England uh, in 1956. So this is an England which is not uh, quote-unquote manly anymore. This is an England which is not really dominant anymore. This is an England which is sort of quite nervous and neurotic uh, you know, about its situatedness in the present and all it can do is look back uh, to the past with a mixed uh, emotion. So you can look back either in anger or you can look back with a very fond nostalgia which is very romantic. Right? So we have, so these are characters, we just spend some time talking about the characters who appear and look back in anger. So Nigel Redfern, uh, you know, Hugh Tanner, Ma Tanner, Hugh Tanner's mother, uh, and Alison and Nigel's mother, Mrs. Redfern. Now there are many other ca minor characters, uh, I'll not spend more time with them, in this Madeline uh, who used to be Jimmy's mistress, we, we just mentioned, we just have uh, one reference to her, uh, a very personal reference, and then she goes away. Uh, there's Webster, uh, uh, you know, a friend of Alison that Jimmy seems to be fond of. Uh, so these are the very minor characters who don't really uh, have a, a significant, substantial function uh, in the play. But the other characters who have a very significant function in terms of the, uh, the plot of the play, uh, they include, obviously, uh, Jimmy's parents, uh, you know, his dying father who went to the Spanish Civil War, as we are told, uh, who died you know, a b battle for ideological causes, uh, for you know, very noble causes. So if you look, if you know the history of the Spanish Civil War, it was a war uh, fought against a, a very brutal fascist regime of Franco. So initially the war started off as a left-wing battle, a resistance against fascism. But as the war progressed, what we found was you know, uh, the left-wing uh, soldiers, the left-wing army was supported uh, subsequently by Stalin's army, by Stalin's fund and then it ended up being a battle between one fascist and another fascist. So the entire ideological nobility, the ideological purity of the war, uh, you know, it started off with a good cause, that got degenerated uh, into becoming a battle between two fascists. So you know, the Spanish Civil War may be seen again, a very, is a very political war, but you know, the fact that Jimmy Porter's father went to the war and fought in the war and died of the war essentially, because he came back as a broken man, he came back as someone who was essentially uh, brutalized and broken by the war, so uh, he's someone who doesn't appear in the play, but he's spoken of extensively. So Jimmy talks about his father quite extensively and also his mother. So this entire episode, uh, which happens to look back in anger uh, sometime in Act 2, scene 2, uh, is, is about uh, childhood trauma. So you know, Jimmy talks about how he's seen his father die. Uh, you know, the fact that um, you know, he, he sort of was 10 years old and then the, the father was dying on a deathbed. He's come back from the war and he's completely broken. And you know, he's ideologically broken. He's, you know, physically broken, is emotionally broken, and then all he has is a, is a ten-year-old boy to listen to him, to his uh, narrative of failure. And that becomes, uh, that sort of informs uh, Jimmy's neurosis, that informs Jimmy's hysteria, that informs Jimmy's misogyny. And this is a very important concept uh, in, in terms of gender studies in the play. The why is Jimmy brought up so uh, afraid of women? And there's one section in the play where he sort of cries out to Cliff, why, why, why do we let the woman, these women bleed us to death? And if you look at you know, the very graphic descriptions of women's activities, they're compared to butchers, they're compared to cannibals, they're compared to barbarians, they're compared to Philistines. So again, we, we mentioned this in the previous lecture, how there's a commonality in terms of misogyny between Jimmy and Hamlet. Because if, even if we read Hamlet by Shakespeare, we find there's a similar kind of misogyny operating over there where Hamlet uh, is scared of the woman, he, he's afraid of the woman in a way. And to cover up the fear, uh, he uses hatred, he uses hate speech, he uses a very violent rhetoric uh, of anger, of repulsion. It's almost uh, as if it's allergic to women. But if it's scratched beneath, if it's scratched beneath the rage, the rhetoric of rage, what we find is a very, uh, you know, scared man, is a very fragile man uh, who has been sort of, you know, uh, not let down, but he feels he's been brutalized by women. So, you know, again, the misogyny in look back in anger uh, is sort of neurotic, it's quite psychological, but you know, what happens in the end, what happens in the course of the play is we have Alison who becomes the receiver, the very passive receiver of Jimmy's violence. And as I mentioned, the violence very quickly transforms from a verbal violence to a visceral violence. So you can almost feel it to the veins. Uh, it becomes physical, of course, at some point. So uh, Jimmy's mother, of course, is another character who, who, who doesn't appear in the course of the play, but then again, we, we hear a lot about her, and we, we are told that Jimmy hates his mother because, you know, uh, she was never there for him, uh, and, you know, we get, to, we get to hear, we get to know that when Jimmy's father was dying, uh, 
uh, his mother was never there and all that Jimmy's father had was a very uh, scared 10 year old boy listening to him, a, a life of failure, a narrative of failure and Jimmy's mother was really never quite that and you know there's another thing that Jimmy tells us his mother was always there for fashionable minorities uh, for fashionable causes but you know Jimmy's father was not fashionable he was a white man uh, who went and fought in the Spanish Civil War and then came back broken and brutalized and then died a very inglorious death uh, so there's something fashionable about it. So again, uh, Jimmy's hatred of the woman is premised on this again. So his hatred of the mother uh, spills over into the hatred of a mother figure. Uh, and you know, uh, that, that sort of extends into the hatred of Alison, hatred of you know, Helena, and we find out later about Helena. We'll talk, talk a little bit about Helena as well. So uh, the characters who don't appear in the play, but are mentioned and are quite significant theatrically and dramatically in this particular uh, play, Look Back in Anger, include Jimmy's parents, Hugh Tanner, uh, you know, Hugh Tanner is this extreme alpha male who doesn't appear in the play. He happens to be Jimmy's best friend and he only occurs, uh, emerges in a conversation between two women, uh, you know, Jimmy and, uh, sorry, Alison and Helena, where Alison tells Helena that if, you haven't, if you've seen Hugh, then Jimmy is a very mild version of Hugh. So Hugh is a barbarian compared to Jimmy. So he, he represents the, a more extreme form of uh, angry young man uh, who leaves England eventually. Who goes, to, who goes to China, we are told, to write a novel uh, because he thinks England is dead, that all the imperial army has come back. Uh, Dame Alison's mob is back. Uh, by Dame Alison's mob, he obviously means Alison's family, who used to be, uh, who were uh, sort of an imperial family station in India, they've come back. So Hugh Tanner leaves England uh, because of this. Hugh Tanner leaves, uh, you know, the entirety of English culture and settles uh, in, in China with the purpose of writing a book. But we never quite know what happened to him. We never quite know what happened to him. Uh, did he actually manage to write a book? Did he actually finish? Uh, we, we're not told. We're not given the information. But we get to know about Hugh Tanner. He's a more extreme version of Jimmy Porter, a more, um, an angrier man, a more bitter man, a more cynical man than Jimmy. So Hugh Tanner, Hugh Tanner's mother, Jimmy's parents, Nigel Redfern. So these are the characters who don't appear directly in the play, uh, but are mentioned. Now, obviously, there's another character in the end of the play. Uh, you know, you can't sort of say he's a character, but he's a half character. Uh, he or she, a half character. Uh, we never quite know, uh, you know, what, uh, what would have happened if the character had arrived in the play. And we're talking about D Jimmy's dead child. So Jimmy and Alison, they have a dead child. So Jimmy, uh, and obviously Alison becomes pregnant with Jimmy's child without Jimmy knowing it in the beginning. And he's told much later by Helena that, you know, Alison's having his child. And it turns out that the child dies in the, in the process of giving birth to it. So we never quite know how the de death happens. We get to know that when Alison comes back at the end of the play, when the child is dead. So the child is another character uh, who doesn't appear in the play. He's a half character who doesn't appear in the world. He doesn't appear in the play world. Uh, so again, but it's mentioned quite extensively uh, at the end of the play. So these are important uh, sort of not minor characters, but uh, important characters in, in the sense that, you know, they don't appear in the play, but they have a very important symbolic function. And I believe by now you, you will have guessed why we're spending time with these characters. Because each of these characters have a certain function, a certain dramatic function uh, in relation to the plot of the play, in relation to the way the play progresses uh, in due course. Right. So. Uh, what we'll do today is we, we just talked about the minor, the, the, so the third person characters in Look Back in Anger, but what we'll do now is look at a particular scene in Look Back in Anger. This, this, scene, this is a scene where, this is actual scene two, where uh, we have um, you know, Alison's father who's come to take her back, uh, having you know, heard from Helena. Helena has obviously moved into the Porter household, as you mentioned, and then of course, uh, you know, she, she becomes Jimmy's mistress eventually. But this is a section where uh, the colonel, this is act two, scene two, this is a section where the colonel comes to pick up a, his daughter uh, from Jimmy. And this is a very interesting scene because not only is it very emotional and, and psychological, but also quite profoundly political. Because what we get to know in this particular scene is the different sense of betrayal, the different sense of bitterness, the different sense of melancholia that the men have in the back in anger. So and it, it's very interesting because uh, Alison tells his fa her father that you are hurt uh, because everything has changed and Jimmy is hurt, and Jimmy is angry because nothing has changed, uh, something must have gone wrong somewhere. So again, it's an entire idea of change, uh, the fact that England has changed you know, culturally, uh, you know, economically, uh, also linguistically to a certain sense. Uh, so all these changes, uh, they, they sort of bring about a collapse of the dominant idea of England.
So again, what we have essentially uh, is an idea of, um, you know, quote unquote, emasculated England. So looking from a global power perspective, England is no longer, um, you know, a manly England, a manly nation. So this entire idea of the manly, you know, empire nation is now gone. Uh, imperialism has come to an end. And what we have essentially now is a hysteric nation who doesn't quite know which way to go. But before I move into the scene in some details, just want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, this is a bit of a digression, but it's a helpful digression to have. Now, I keep telling you, as I mentioned uh, in this particular lecture, that Jimmy Porter is a very good example of a hysteric young man, right? So he's someone who uh, doesn't seem to know what to do in, in, in this situation he finds himself in. Uh, he sort of screams from his armchair and he sort of shouts from his armchair and that's all he can seem to be able to do. And, you know, his entire idea uh, is to sort of, you know, bring about change rhetorically. So he's been to university, as we know, but obviously uh, he doesn't have a job. He doesn't really have much of a financial capital, although he has a sort of a useless cultural capital uh, that he doesn't quite know how to put into good use. He sort of runs a sweet stall at the end of the day. Now, uh, this is obviously not a very good idea of masculinity. This is not exactly what we call dominant glorious masculinity. It's just the reverse of that. It's very inglorious. Uh, it's very, very unglamorous. It's deglamorized uh, kind of masculinity. And that's the reason why, that's one of the reasons why we call this play kitchen sink drama. It's about very gritty realism. Uh, it's, there's nothing romantic about Lubbock in anger. There's nothing lofty about Lubbock in anger. It's very gritty, very dirty, uh, you know, uh, sort of messed up people, messed up households, messed up uh, in, interiors. So nothing really is clean and tidy and nice in Lubbock in anger. Okay? So that's the reason why I use, a, uh, use the term kitchen sink drama. It's that kind of a gritty, realistic drama. Now, uh, having given you this gritty, uh, dirty, messy picture of Lubbock in anger and the kind of masculinity which emerges out of it, which is what, what the real situation was, it's interesting to bear in mind that this is also the time which produces Ian Fleming's James Bond. Right? In the moment I give you James Bond, uh, you know, we, we're talking about a glamorized you know, British intelligence uh, spy. Uh, who has got license to kill, who never runs out of cash, never runs out of good looks, never runs out of tuxedos. Uh, so in other, in other words, he's, he's got endless resources, uh, cultural, uh, he's very posh, he speaks the Queen's English, um, so he can flirt with any woman with, with, with a great amount of charm, but at the same time he can shoot anyone uh, from any distance, jump from any building, never get killed, and never run out of cash. So does, does it ever occur to you that James Bond never runs out of cash? You know, no matter where he goes, he always seems to be endowed with enormous amount of uh, financial capital. Now, this, the reason why I'm talking about James Bond, why I'm mentioning Lubbock in anger, because you know, James Bond as a genre, as a kind of literature was produced at that time, this particular time, 1956, 60s. So it's very much a Cold War phenomenon, James Bond. Now, it's not very hard to see, if you're looking at it from a gender perspective, from a uh, sort of a historical perspective, it's not very hard to see James Bond emerges as a sort of a imperial, post-imperial wish fulfillment fantasy, right? So he is something which England is not at that point of time. So what England really is, is something like Jimmy Porter. So this is real England, you know, emasculated, uh, messed up, not really uh, oriented to us, um, you know, or designed for perfection, or designed for greatness. It's just a converse of that. It's on its way out uh, in terms of glory and greatness. But James Bond is a bit of a wish fulfillment fantasy. He's a spy who never gets caught. Uh, I mean, he does get caught, but he always manages to escape. He never dies. And he's got license to kill. He can travel across the world without thinking about passports or visas. So he, in a way, is an extreme extension of the imperial fantasy of England. And if you look at it from a masculinist perspective, he's typically male fantasy. Because you know, if you look at James Bond films, you find the woman in James Bond films extremely objectified. Uh, they are all commodities, disposable commodities, uh, which, which can be used and then trashed away uh, in a, almost in a very non-human kind of a way. And so, you know, the same way as Bond uses gadgets, uh, cars, uh, very, very interesting looking uh, you know, guns, etc. But all these are disposable uh, and they come very quickly, they're very easily accessible and they're very easily disposable. So again, this entire idea of James Bond as a wish fulfillment male fantasy of Cold War England is something that we uh, need to be uh, so aware of because this is the same time which produces a look back in anger, this very gritty, realistic kitchen sink drama about an emasculated, hysteric England. Okay? So just giving you the picture, just so you have the political, cultural, psychological climate which produces this play, uh, but at the same time, it produces something like James Bond, which is just the opposite of what Jimmy Porter is.
Now, if you come to uh, Act 2, Scene 2 in Loop Back in Anger, which is probably the only scene which we'll do in some details. So, this is the scene where uh, the Colonel Red Fern has come to pick up his daughter from Jimmy's house. And Jimmy's gone away, obviously, uh, you know, uh, we, we get to know the, the scene before that Jimmy, you know, has heard the news of Martana's stroke. So, Hugh Tanner's mother, who Jimmy looks up to as a mother figure, has suffered a stroke, uh, is probably dying, and she do does die in the end. So, Jimmy goes to her, uh, asks Alison to join him. She does not. Uh, she goes to the church uh, with Helena instead. And again, this is very interesting because the church represents the very established uh, you know, architecture, the, the architectural establishment uh, that Jimmy Porter abhors, or at least wants to abhor. Uh, so, he wants to move away from establishment, he wants to move away from uh, the established orders of life and society, etc., with its very, very left wing, uh, iconoclastic, subversive idea of masculinity, and he wants to impose that on his wife. But of course, that doesn't work, uh, especially when uh, Helena comes in as his embodiment of middle class morality. Uh, so you find Helena Charles uh, as a person who is a, you know, a theater actress, but at the same time, she embodies this middle class morality and she influences Alison uh, to the extent that she leaves Jimmy. Alison leaves Jimmy Porter, but before she leaves them, uh, we get to know in the play, she writes a letter for Jimmy, uh, and of course, uh, as she's leaving Jimmy, uh, her father comes to pick her up. So it's a very conventional kind of an adieu. So she writes a sort of a romantic letter uh, to Jimmy, asking him to give, give her some time, uh, that, you know, uh, that she's forever grateful for whatever he's done for her, but she needs a bit of a break, etc. It's a very conventionally written le letter, a breakup letter, or a hiatus letter. Uh, you know, and then of course the father comes to pick up a daughter in a very conventional kind of a way. So Act Two, Scene Two is about a colonel coming over uh, to pick up her do his daughter, and we have a description of the colonel which we'll spend some time looking at. So this is Act Two, Scene Two, the very opening of Act Two, Scene Two, in Look Back in Anger, where we look at the description of the colonel. Uh, so he's a large, handsome man, about 60, 40 years of being a soldier, sometimes conceals the essentially gentle, kindly man underneath. Brought up to command respect, uh, he is often slightly withdrawn and uneasy now that he finds himself in a world where his authority is, has lately become less and less questionable. Okay? So this is interesting. His authority has become less and less questionable, or in other words, more and more questionable. And this is exactly what we are talking about when we say this is a transition play from an imperial England to a post-imperial England. This is a person who is so used to being, you know, uh, you know, giving out commands. So, so used to being waited upon, he doesn't quite know what's wrong with the world. No, why is no one uh, obeying him? Why is no one fawning on him? Why is no one waiting on him? Because the reason is, you know, imperialism has ended. There's no reason why people should wait on him. Uh, so, you know, what we have, in other words, is that this is a, a decline or a death of imperial masculinity. Now, if you remember the George Orwell play, the, the, the essay that we did, Shooting an Elephant, which was about imperial masculinity and its performativity, the how it, sort of, it should compulsively have some performances. Uh, you know, Shooting an Elephant itself becomes a symbolic performance in, the, in, in the, that particular essay. Now, if you look at it from a masculinity perspective, and you know, by the time you come to look back in anger, and you come to someone like uh, you know, Colonel Redfern, uh, imperialism has, has ended, uh, so it's the end of imperial masculinity. So his authority is becoming more and more questionable. Now, what that, that tells us, and the reason why I'm spending some time and correlating it with Orwell essay, is that masculinity, like femininity, like any gender identity, is a construct. Right? It's a text. It's a text which is constructed by cultural codes. It's a text which is constructed by political situations by ideological situations, by economic situations. So obviously, uh, if you go back and, and, and remember Shatran uh, Shri or the chess players, you'll find that the entire idea of Nawabi masculinity was economically due to mind. When the economy went away, when the Nawabs went away, when the British came over, that brand of masculinity was in its way out. So you know, equally, essentially, we have here that the imperial masculinity is on its way out because imperialism as an economic system has ended. Uh, and with it, the cultural accords related to the system uh, have also gone away. So, you know, this is a classic case in point of how masculinity and femininity and any gender identity is notoriously sensitive to cultural accords. And I've ke I keep telling you that, I, so I probably start to bore you by now, but it's absolutely imperative that you understand this, that masculinity, femininity, all kinds of gender identities are notoriously sensitive and determined by cultural accords. Now, the code has changed, right? So, the change is obviously from imperialism to post-imperialism. So that's the change in code. 
so because that code has changed, uh, his entire idea of masculinity, the, the one he embodies has also changed and the reception of, uh, to that masculinity has also changed. So no one will take uh, you know, Colonel Redfern so seriously anymore because you know, he's not an imperial officer anymore. Okay? So, there's a conversation over here where we have the colonel and uh, Alison talking about Jimmy uh, and the colonel asks the obvious question, so why does, if he hates us so much uh, and, and Alison tells him categorically that Jimmy hates uh, everyone in the Redfern family including the colonel uh, and the colonel's wife and Nigel and of course Alison. Now the, the colonel asks a very naive but obvious question, if he hates you so much, why did he marry you? Right? And this brings us to the question of class in Lubbock and Anger, so about which we, we spoke a little bit in the, in, the, in the previous lecture, if you remember. So Alison's response to that is probably he married me to take revenge on this particular class. Because, you know, again, look at the way how the woman the use, is used as a trophy, as a commodity uh, for vendetta, uh, for class vendetta. So if, if you want to have a class war between two classes, the easiest way to hurt a class, the easiest way uh, to humiliate a class. Uh, is to take away its woman, right? So again, we have this entire commodification of the woman, the entire reification of the woman. The woman is an object. Uh, she becomes a vessel for violence. She becomes a vessel for vendetta. She becomes a vessel, an object of desire, an object of hatred, an object of uh, revenge, etc. So this is a, a situation, a very complex gender situation where the woman becomes the very passive recipient of male desire, fantasy, schema, etc. Okay? So the obvious answer that Alison can give to the uh, colonel at this point of time is that he probably married me to take revenge on our class, this middle class, upper middle class, because he comes from a working class and then of course the best way he can humiliate our class is to take away a, a woman from the class. Okay? So again we find uh, how the gender in this particular play you know, uh, is sort of extends into acts of violence, acts of appropriation, acts of aspiration, acts of desire. Okay. Now, he, he talks about that in some details and then the, the colonel asks, uh, and the, but the colonel seems to be sort of interested or intrigued by Jimmy because of his exotic otherness, right? And he sort of asks um, uh, Alison very naively, uh, what does he say about me? What does Jimmy think about me? Uh, does he have anything to say about me? How does he describe me? To which Alison replies that I think he rather likes you. He likes it because he can feel sorry for you, uh, conscious of what she's saying is going to hurt him. And this is what Jimmy apparently says about uh, Colonel Redfern, poor old daddy, just one of those sturdy old plants left over from the Edwardian wilderness that can't understand why the sun isn't shining anymore. Right? So he's a sturdy old plant, uh, according to Jimmy, uh, from an Edward Edwardian wilderness that doesn't understand why the sun isn't shining anymore. So again, we have uh, an example of decadence. So he used to be this sort of dominant man in, in imperial England uh, situated in India but of course imperialism has ended and he finds himself uh, in a situation where he doesn't quite know where the sun isn't shining anymore. Now the metaphor of the sun is important over here because if you remember one of the slogans, one of the uh, very proud arrogant slogans about um, imperialism was that the British, the, the British used to say the sun never sets in the British Empire because at some point in the empire there's always a sun. So the, the metaphor of the sun over here is important. So uh, Jimmy says, uh, Daddy, or Alice's father, is like an Edwardian wild plant who doesn't quite know where the sun isn't shining anymore. So again, it's a metaphor for emasculation, a metaphor for innovation, exhaustion, right? It's, it's an end of a certain kind of masculinity. It's an end of a certain brand of masculinity, right? And that becomes uh, the beginning of hysteria in England where everyone's confused. Someone like uh, Colonel Redfern is confused because uh, no one is taking him seriously anymore. He doesn't really seem to have authority anymore. And Jimmy, of course, is confused because he doesn't seem to know what he wants. And this is uh, the Colonel speaking, um, you know, and uh, he sort of admits that Jimmy is right. He says to his, to his, to his daughter that, you know, probably your husband is right. Uh, probably I am. Uh, what was it? An old plant left over from the Edwardian wilderness. Uh, and can't understand why the sun isn't shining anymore. So, you know, and then he gives you a very uh, emotional description of his experiences as, a, as an imperial officer. So he said, I left England in 1914, uh, and except for every 10 years or so, I never really saw England. So my idea of England and Englishness was what I derived from India. But, but in India, it was very, very different. It was very, very dominant. It was very, very luxuriant. Uh, so he was a dominant male in the, in the whole pack in India. 
So his idea of Englishness is very different. It was a constructed idea of Englishness, right? Uh, imperial Englishness, which is dominant by default. Now he said that, uh, you know, the England I remembered was with the one I left in 1914, and I was happy to go on remembering it that way. So that was the image of England that stuck in my mind, the 1914 England. Besides, I had a Maharaja's army to command, uh, and that was my world, and I loved it all. Uh, and at that time, it looked like going on forever. When I think of it now, it seems like a dream. Uh, if only it could have gone on forever. Those long, cool evenings up the hills, everything purple and golden, your mother and I were so happy then. Uh, I seemed as though, it seemed as though everything, uh, we had everything we could ever want. I think the last day the sun shone was when a dirty little train steamed out of the crowded, suffocating Indian station and the battalion army, battalion band playing for all it was worth. I knew in my heart it was all over them, everything. So the final image of the train leaving the station, uh, you know, where we have a train full of British people presumably coming back to England, uh, well, they, they probably take a ship at some point, but at that point they're taking a train from the station uh, and that becomes the final image of India which stays in the colonel's mind. So he says, uh, you know, that was the England I had in mind, the England that was constructed as an imperial fantasy in India. And the real England was very away from me, very far from me, and I had no idea of it uh, until I came back. And when I came back, I couldn't recognize my own country. So again, we have the very complex entanglement of memory and masculinity. So his masculinity was informed by his memory. And when the memory changed, his masculinity also changed. Now, in, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're thinking of uh, Kathy Mansfield's fly at this point, which too has a similar kind of an entanglement. So the boss's masculinity in Mansfield's fly is dependent on his ability to remember. And the moment he loses the ability, the moment he loses that memory, uh, the intensity of the memory, his masculinity becomes compromised immediately. Similarly, OAM. Uh, the entire idea, the entire uh, embodiment of masculinity uh, th that is sort of exhibited by uh, this person, Colonel Edward Fern, is dependent on what he remembers, it's dependent on his memory, right? And the moment that memory loses and he, he forgets and, and he moves away from the memory, his masculinity too is loosened uh, and it doesn't quite have the same kind of a privilege or you know, power or authority anymore. In other words, his hegemonic gender identity is now questioned and compromised. There is no hegemonic gender identity left in England, in this particular England. Uh, it doesn't really have any hegemony left because England as a country has lost its hegemony. Uh, it's no longer a bully in world politics. It's no longer a global player in world politics. It's very much an, an also ran, uh, you know, something which is so secondary and even tertiary in the bigger scheme of things. Could I mention this was a time which is pretty much the beginning of the Cold War between Russia and America, and England was very much been the second or third fiddle. Uh, in global politics at this point in time. Now this is the section where Alison tells a very political thing which is also quite emotional. After the, after the colonel had d described to her what it feels like to be an emasculated man uh, back in England which he doesn't quite recognize anymore. So this is what she responds with. And this is very, very you know, poignant, psychological as well as political. And she says, you're hurt because everything has changed. Jimmy is hurt because everything is the same and neither of you can face it. Something must have gone some wrong somewhere, isn't it? So you are hurt, so you being Colonel Redfern, you are hurt because everything has changed, Jimmy is hurt because everything is the same, and none of you can face it. Something must have gone wrong somewhere, right? So again, uh, what we have here is two different orders of masculinity. So we have the Colonel Redfern who embodies this imperial order of masculinity, and we have Jimmy Porter who embodies this bitter, cynical, post-imperial, exhausted order of masculinity. And both of them, you know, they can't face the reality in which they stand. But in a very interesting sense, there seems to be some kind of an empathy between these two people. Because, you know, the colonel tells quite unequivocally that he sort of can see where Jimmy is coming from. So he says that, I, mean, I can understand why this person is so agonized. I can understand why this person is so bitter. And on the other hand, we, we, we get to know from Alison that Jimmy sort of likes the colonel likes him because he can feel sorry for him, right? So again, we seem to have some kind of a male empathy between these two people, between these two figures, the colonel, Redfern, and Jimmy Porter. And that, that sort of tells us something about the gender identity and location in this particular play. So, and we'll end this scene, uh, and this is, this, this is a really complex scene because what we have is, you know, Alison leaving the household with her father. Uh, she's sort of going away because Helena had written a letter to her father asking him to come and pick up the daughter 
uh, so she's leaving. But strangely enough, um, Alison doesn't, uh, Helena doesn't leave immediately. So she says, or she claims to say, that she's got a few more uh, sort of plays coming up. So she needs to stay for maybe for an evening or two. But we, we, we sort of get a sense that she's probably lying because uh, in the course of the play, we never see her going for any rehearsal anymore. We never see her going for any performance anymore. Uh, so maybe she is sort of setting up the situation where uh, she will start to become Jimmy's mistress. But at this point in the play, we have Alison leaving with her father and Helena staying back. Uh, and then, you know, Jimmy comes back, obviously very, very agitated uh, after the funeral of Martana. And he doesn't find he uh, Alison in, in, in the house. As a matter of fact, uh, he says, when I was coming into the house, I almost got ran over. Uh, run over by uh, Alison in the car, and uh, obviously the colonel was driving the car. So he comes back angry, agitated, bitter, very, very bitter, and he takes it out, tries to take it out in Helena. However, something else happens, something very strange and symbolic happens in this point in the play. So uh, he comes back and he starts again this rhetoric of rage. He starts again this very violent anger directed at the woman, but the, the violence becomes visceral, uh, but then it becomes visceral in a different sense. So very quickly we have a conversion from extreme anger, extreme hatred to extreme lust. So you have a situation where uh, you know, Jimmy shouts at uh, Helena, calls him, calls her an evil, mean-minded uh, virgin, uh, you know, and then she slaps him back. And that seems it's a very psychological, intense, uh, almost erotic kind of a scene in terms of his hatred. And now we find immediately that Jimmy tries to hit her back, uh, but he cannot. And instead, he covers, her, he covers his face and almost caves in, uh, at, at which point um, sort of Helena pulls him towards her and starts kissing passionately. So again, what we find over here is a very quick transition from extreme hatred to extreme anger. And we have a very complex gender identification and this identification happening over here. So Helena is very quickly uh, moving away from being this middle class model woman into becoming a non middle class quote unquote immoral woman who is very happy to be Jimmy's mistress. And Jimmy very quickly uh, moves away from being this working class hero uh, into this very uh, conforming, loving lover. Uh, you know, again, very, very quickly. So I'll just read out this section and then we'll conclude and then we'll sort of talk a little bit about uh, the psychological uh, impact of the scene in terms of gender studies. So, uh, so Jimmy comes back and interestingly, this is the point where he's first informed that he's about to have a child, that Alison's about to have a child. So Helena informs him that you know, your wife is about to have a child and, you know, and uh, hopes that he sort of softens in hearing it, but he doesn't soften. Uh, he actually gets more enraged and he says, I don't care. So this is act two scene two, the end of act two scene two, a little back in anger. He actually says, I don't care. I don't care if she's going to have a baby. I don't care if it has two heads. Uh, he knows the fingers are itching. Uh, do I disgust you? Well, go on, slap my face. But remember what I told you before, will you? So he had told Helena before that you know, he doesn't have any public school scruples about hitting women. So if a woman hits, her, hits him, he will hit her back. That's what he had told Helena uh, in a little earlier in the play, that you know, if you hit me, if you slap me, don't for a moment think that I'm a gentleman, that I have uh, public school manners about not hitting women. I don't have any etiquette at all. So if you hit me, I'll hit you back. That's what he had you know, confessed. That's what he you know, dared Helena uh, at some point earlier in this particular play. Now, and then he says, for 11 hours, uh, I have been watching someone I love very much going through the sordid process of dying. She was alone, and I was only one with her. And when I have to walk behind the coffin on Thursday, it, I'll be on my own again. Because that bitch won't even send her a bunch of flowers. I know. She made a great mistake of all kinds. She thought just because Hugh's mother was a deprived and ignorant old woman who said all the wrong things and all the wrong places, she couldn't be taken seriously. And you think I should be overcome with awe because a cruel, stupid girl is going to have a baby. Anguish in his voice. I can't believe it, I can't, grabbing her shoulder. Well, the performance is over. Now leave me alone and get out, you evil-minded little virgin. Now the word performance is very, very interesting over here because, you know, we, we talk about how people are playing different roles in Look Back in Anger. So obviously it's performance in one literal level because everyone's acting in Look Back in Anger. But also within the drama, uh, we have people who act in different roles. So, uh, and for, don't remember, don't, don't forget, sorry, don't forget that Helena is a professional actress. So she is performing a certain kind of role. At this point in time, she's still being this middle-class model woman uh, know, who Jimmy abhors. And he actually tells her that, you know, 
you are evil minded little virgin, which is obviously a terrible thing to say, especially and it's, dark, it's targeted uh, very, very violently against middle class morality, against middle class female morality. Okay? And then he tells her, the performance is over, so now get out. And the reaction is very, very physical. It's almost like you know, you're reading a D.H. Lawrence short story. It's so psychological and it becomes eroticized very, very quickly. Uh, she slaps his face, face savagely. Uh, she slaps his face savagely. An expression of horror and disbelief floods his face, but it drains away. And all that is left is pain. His hand goes up to his head, and a muffled cry of despair escapes him. Helena tears his hand away and kisses him passionately, drawing him down beside her. Curtain. So again, uh, this is the sort of end of the scene and a curtain swirl. But we, what we find away is a very quick transition from hatred to lust, uh, from a middle class a model woman uh, to uh, an immoral woman who is very happy to kiss and you know, enter into a, a sexual erotic relationship with a married man. So again, the entire transition is very quick, the entire transition is very, very volatile and it's very performative. And that's the reason why the word performance comes away up so very quickly uh, and, and it's a very loaded word away up. Now, but the other thing I wanted to remind you is, uh, if you remember Jimmy had told Helena that if you hit me, I'll hit you back because I haven't been to a public school. Uh, I know I haven't been corrupted by culture, so and if a woman hits me, I have no scruples hitting her about hitting her back. So I will hit you back because I don't have any quote unquote etiquette. However, you find when he actually gets hit by Helena, when he's slapped by Helena, he actually cannot hit her back. Uh, and what does it tell us? That tells us that Jimmy Porter II has been corrupted by culture, has been corrupted by education. And this is interesting because, you know, education over here uh, is, uh, we talked about the, the gendered idea of knowledge, the very gendered quality of knowledge in Heart of Darkness. So the knowledge of truth in Heart of Darkness is very, very gendered. Only the male, uh, only the men have it. And the men who go out there and impale, uh, you know, center, they have it. And, and when, it, when they come back uh, to the sort of European inside, the interiors of Europe, they sort of lie to the woman because the woman must be lied to, the woman must be misinformed in order for imperialism to continue in the, in the guise of a Christian enterprise. Now, you know, so knowledge in, in Heart of Darkness is very, very gendered. But over here, what we have is culture. So culture in Lubbock and Langa is very, very gendered as well. So Jimmy Porter is trying his best uh, to come across as an uncultured uh, savage. Right, this is what he wants to be because that's a very manly thing to be in Ludbeck and Anger. However, when he actually gets slapped by a woman uh, after having screamed at her uh, some very, very dirty explet expletives, uh, he cannot actually hit her back. He cannot actually slap her back. And that tells us that he is essentially being, quote unquote, uh, sort of emasculated by culture. So his entire uh, boasting about being this manly person who hit back a woman if a woman hits him. Uh, it, it all goes uh, sort of down the drain because he, he, we realize all spectacularly that Jimmy Porter is someone who actually cannot hit you back. Uh, all he has is a rhetoric of rage. All he has is very violent language. Uh, this very visceral violent language. But when it actually comes to hitting, when it actually comes to taking the physical action, uh, he, he, he will cave in. He will cover down. And if we look at the expression over here, you, that, that is quite spectacularly evident. And, uh, and the description over here is an expression of horror and disbelief floods his face, but it drains away and all that is left is pain. His hand goes up in his head and a muffled cry of despair escapes him. A muffled cry of despair, and that's not very manly. That's almost like, you know, uh, a very, uh, so he's sort of infantilized, uh, he's emasculated, uh, he's sort of feminized in a way, uh, in, in very stereotypical sexist terms, of course. Uh, but this entire idea, this entire boasting of being this manly man who will hit you back, uh, if someone hits them, that, that is completely uh, deconstructed uh, in this particular scene. So instead what we have is an exposure of Jimmy's fragility as a person. So he's a very fragile person. He's someone uh, beneath all the surface of you know, this rhetoric of rage, uh, all this sort of very, very angry uh, language of violence and you know, uh, you know, vitriolic anger. You know, he, he's actually a very scared person. He's actually a very scared man. And he's very quickly going to cave in and cover down and collapse and break uh, whenever someone attacks them. Now this concludes the scene. Uh, now what we, we have in a nutshell, the reason why we have chosen the scene and have sort of studied it in some details is it brings in a very important character, Colonel Redfern, who used to be uh, an imperial officer in India, who used to be a figure of manly authority, who used to enjoy uh, the privilege of a certain gender identity. Again, uh, look at the way this gender identity is related to other issues such as race. So he was a white 
colonnaded in a non-white space, an imperial space. So obviously that gave him a lot of privilege, a lot of entitlement uh, as a person. So his entire sense of entitlement and privilege was dependent on a mixture of race and gender. Right? Now, the fact is imperialism has ended and we get to know that England is no longer a superpower. He's come back to England and he can't quite recognize England around him. And he confesses quite clearly that England he had in his mind was England in India. So that was England he had in his mind, which is a constructed fantasy of imperial England. So there he was leading the Maharaja's army. And the Maharaja was some kind of a, so presumably he was in a princely state. Uh, and he was a leader of an army. So he was very used to some kind of a lifestyle, a lifestyle of luxury, entitlement, privileges. And that is all gone. That's all ended with the end of imperialism. It's come back. And the last train uh, in this particular scene is a very symbolic train. Uh, I, I, you should pay some attention when you read this particular scene in great details. The last train leaving the station was a train full of uh, the, the Anglo-Indians and the Europeans who were stationed in that particular town and were now on the way out. And the the battalion band uh, was playing for all of his words and then the, the colonel knew at that point in time it was all over. He knew in his heart of hearts everything was over. The sun had set. So the entire uh, climate over there, the entire culture is a culture of decadence, something coming to an end. And that's very, very important because you know what happens immediately and the immediate replication is uh, the gender identity and privilege, the superiority, the supposed superiority of his gender identity is now demolished. He's come back to England and now he's a nobody. So no one really, uh, really takes him unquestioningly. So he says, and, and the description over here is quite clear, when it mentions that his authority is more and more questioned now. So people are questioning his authority. And now we have Jimmy Porter, obviously who is a bitter, cynical, post imperial man, uh, just the overse of James Bond. And do, do, do keep the James Bond uh, analogy in mind because it will help us to understand what Jimmy Porter really is. He's the opposite, he's the mirror opposite of James Bond. Uh, the very de-glamorized, uh, claustrophobic, bitter, cynical uh, Englishman in, 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 a, in a Cold War situation. And also look at the way, if you look at the space and look back in anger, and we'll spend some time on space in our next lecture, the entire space is a very domestic, claustrophobic space. There is no exotic outside. Uh, all the action happens inside a drawing room and look back in anger, right? So Jimmy Porter, with all his manliness, with all his prowess, with all his rhetoric of rage, never leaves the room except when he goes to a funeral for a woman. Uh, and you know uh, a mother figure and it comes back from there but ex apart from that he doesn't leave the room an entire action takes place inside a domestic setting so again this is not really uh, a quote unquote a manly setting this is not really a war trench this is not really a battleground or an imperial landscape but a very domesticated uh, dodgy uh, messed up dirty gritty uh, domestic interior and the entire action takes place there so the space in look back in anger is also very gendered and we talked about how hysteria is re-gendered in look back in anger. So from being uh, in, in a very sexist understanding of hysteria was it was female melody, but now we have a male hysteric. And likewise, the sense of space too changes. Uh, so the very sexist un idea understanding of domestic space, which is female, is now inhabited by the man. The man never leaves the house in look back in anger, except when he goes in a sweet stall to run a sweet stall in the market, or when he goes in a funeral uh, to pay his last respect for his mother figure. The space, emotions, affect, uh, they're all very deeply gendered in look back in anger. And the reason behind this is, 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 a, is a wider political narrative of change, of uh, end of imperialism, uh, Britain collapsing as superpower, and then the rise of USA and the USSR in global politics and what it does to the, uh, you know, the, the, the metal of Britain as a manly nation. So all that come together. So you know, we can see how gender is a very complex and loaded term. It's not something which happens in isolation.